It is now time for oral questions, and I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty Loyal Opposition. So much, Speaker. Thank you, Speaker. My first question this morning is uh, for the Premier. Yesterday, last night, in fact, the science table released uh, a report that basically says the pandemic is now completely out of control. Completely out of control is what the science table is saying is happening here in Ontario. The government's response seems to be, well, we'll put up a few more field hospitals and just watch as more people get sick. Speaker, the Premier has ignored all of the warnings and has walked us directly into a third wave. The question I have is why does the Premier continue to ignore all of the warnings from hospitals, from his own experts, uh, from nurses, from doctors? Why does he continue to ignore the warnings and refuse to act to stop the spread of the third wave? Respond to Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker, and uh, thank you for the question. Since the beginning of this pandemic, our government has taken focused, prudent action to protect the health and well-being of all Ontarians, and we've taken many steps in order to do this. We've also been following the guidance and research that's been done by our public health experts, Dr. Williams, the measures of the public health table, the science advisory table, and many others. We have taken steps to reduce the variants coming into Ontario. We developed a six-point plan to do that, including, before the federal government did it, the testing of all incoming arrivals from other countries coming into Canada to prevent this uh, uh, UK variant from coming in. It is here now, and we are taking steps to expand our capacity in our hospitals to make sure we do the testing that we need and to do the vaccinations that we need as well in order to protect Ontarians. It's important to note that we have delivered over 2,102,000 vaccines in the last very short while. We're going to continue to do more as we race against time to prevent these variants from overcoming our system, but we have built in all the capacity that we need in order to make sure that everyone who needs to be in hospital will be treated appropriately. Supplementary question. Well, Speaker, the science table was pretty clear that the vaccines are not going to win here, that the variants are winning in Ontario. That's why they're pleading for this government and this premier to take action. And I, I would have to say I agree that there are things that could have been done. There are actions that could have taken place, but this government refused, this premier refused, to put in things like paid sick days, things like paid vacation time, uh, things like smaller class sizes to keep kids in school safe, things like a vaccine rollout that actually works, things like public health precautions that actually protect people from COVID-19. But this is what uh, Dr. Warner says in describing the lack of willingness of this government to get out ahead of this virus. And I quote, we will have people dying because of deferred and delayed non-COVID care. Healthcare workers feel they are screaming at a government who doesn't care. Question. The government has allowed the third wave to spiral out of control. When is this premier going to act and get ahead of the crisis that we are in? Minister of Health. Well, thank you, Speaker, and I'd have to say to the Leader of the Official Opposition, through you, Mr. Speaker, that it's very disappointing when asked yesterday about Order. what she would do in this situation, the only thing that she could come up with was paid sick days. Yeah. Paid sick days, where what have we done? We have made sure that we've uh, uh, delivered the vaccines, we've yeah. delivered the booking Order. system, the patient care portal, we've made sure that we've put over $5 billion into our hospital system since this began, including $1.8 billion in the budget in order to support the over 3,100 new beds that we've put in since the pandemic began, to support the backlog of surgeries that have had to be postponed because of this, and to make sure that the hospitals have over 3.4 percent increase in funding to be able to provide the support that they need in all of our facilities. That's what we've done. All the leader of the op official opposition can come with is paid sick days, which, by the way, we already have. The final supplementary. Well, Speaker, I think it's pretty clear that back in February, experts were giving this Premier and this Minister advice as to what needed to happen to stop the spread of COVID-19. And I've just listed out in my last question a number of those things that this Premier and this government refused to do. 
Paid sick days absolutely are part of it. Yeah. Paid time off for uh, vaccinations, making sure that our schools are safe for our kids, having a vaccine rollout that actually works and prioritizes the people that need the vaccine the most. Speaker. Order. And making sure that public health measures are put into place, public health precautions are put into place to keep people safe. Why has the government refused the advice of these experts since, last Feb since February past? Why have they not listened to the experts and dragged us into a crisis that we are in now, a third wave that is completely out of control? To respond, the Premier. Well, through, through you, Mr. Speaker, I know the Leader of the Opposition always wants to quote uh, Dr. Warner, and he's a great doctor. He messages me as well. Uh, I'll quote some, some other folks here. The Ontario Hospital Association, the CEO, the Ontario Hospital Association appreciates the historic financial support for hospitals in the 2021 budget. These investments will be vital to stabilizing the hospital sector for its duration of the pandemic and preparing for the COVID recovery. Uh, another long-term care association. Uh, commitments to Ontario's budget 2021, the most significant investment in decades, in decades, is what is ignored by the Liberals and NDP in Ontario's long-term care sector, and they will make meaningful differences in the lives of Ontario seniors. Why don't we go to, uh, again, Smokey Thomas, OPSU. Smokey Thomas is calling today's budget a positive step towards health and economic recovery, saying that the support for job creation and public services is the way to go. A again, another uh, quote from Advan Age, Ontario. Thank you. Thank you very much. The member for York Centre will come to order. Next question, Leader of the Opposition. Thanks, Speaker. My next question is also for the Premier, but I have to say it's pretty galling that the Premier, on the very day, year, one year anniversary of the, uh, the claim that there was going to be an iron ring put around long term care, that he had the nerve to actually talk about long term care today, is, um, is pretty frightening. But my next question is actually about, about schools, Speaker. Students, parents, Teachers are frustrated. They're frustrated, they're confused, and they're concerned about what's happening with COVID-19. The latest confusion, of course, uh, came yesterday around the April uh, break. On February 11th, the Premier said March break is going to be pushed into April. Yesterday, within hours of each other, the Premier and his Education Minister contradicted each other about what, what, what might be happening for April. <laughs> so the question is, why can't the government ever provide certainty and answers for parents and kids and teachers when it comes to what's happening to their education system? Minister of Education. Uh, Mr. Speaker, our government believes in following the best public health and science uh, that comes to the cabinet. Obviously, we are responding to a changing risk profile in the province. We obviously have committed ourselves to delay, not cancel the March break, moving into April. We are committed to respecting that. We've continued to follow the Chief Medical Officer of Health's advice. We're building out a plan, and we will be announcing it in the coming days to further strengthen the safety of children and staff upon their re-entrance following the April break. We're committed to expanding testing, as well as stronger screening protocols before a student and a potential case enters a school. We appreciate the challenge that this pandemic has imposed on working parents. We know this is not easy. Their patience, their flexibility, their commitments to work with government and their public health agencies, I think, has been at the core of our success in Ontario. We now deal with the variants of concern. We have to respond to this risk. I think parents expect us to make the tough decisions when appropriate. But when it comes to April break, we plan to proceed. We'll continue to follow the best advice of the Chief Medical Officer of Health. And if anything changes, given the day-to-day -day change and fluctuation in case numbers in the province of Ontario, we'll make sure all families know that well in advance. A supplementary question. Speaker, that sounds like a rerun of the promises that the minister was making last time uh, and never did come to pass. Those uh, extra measures never did come to pass, Speaker. But look, all parents and teachers and kids want is a safe classroom and a stable working environment. That's what they want, safe classrooms and stable learning environments. Instead, we saw massive cuts in last week's budget, massive cuts. We've seen a government that would prefer to pull resources from classrooms uh, instead of invest in the stability of our kids. The ongoing uncertainty around our education system is, is problematic. It's not what 
kids and students and teachers and parents need right now. So my question is, why is it about cuts and confusion instead of stability for kids, instead of support for the pe young people question. who need it the most right now? Minister of Education. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, in the budget that was unveiled by the Minister of Finance last week, we allocated an additional $700 million net new dollars year over year for September. We also acknowledge that in the coming grant for student needs, a, the principal vehicle of funding for school boards, then more investments will be there for areas of reading and mathematics supports, for STEM education, for special education and mental health, recognizing globally that this pandemic has disproportionately impacted our young people. We will be there for young people, for our students, as we have been over the past two years. Every single year under our government, funding has increased the highest levels ever recorded in Ontario history by design because we believe in public education, because we believe in our young people, and we recognize the challenge they face, which is why we enhance supports for remote learning. It's why we enhance funding in class. We're going to deliver education to families that meets their needs, that make sure that they have excellence within their schools. Response. And of course, our priority continues to be keeping kids safe in the province of Ontario. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, parents, uh, parents don't believe any of that, and students certainly are not feeling that way. But I have to say, the confusion and the instability that this government has created for students, for parents, for teachers is completely unacceptable. It's been a year of massive confusion. Instead of spending money on making those classrooms safe and stabilizing our education system, the government just didn't want to do that. And instead, kids have suffered the consequences. Government never, ever got ahead of this virus, and they just scramble at the last minute to react instead of planning ahead. Parents, students, and teachers have been left behind by this government over this last year. So the question is, when will the government start actually providing the stability, the supports, the reliability that, that kids and parents and teachers need to get through the rest of the school year? Speaker, we certainly agree that uh, students and parents are the government's priority. It's why, when you look at the budget allocated last week, an additional $700 million more dollars, the largest summer learning program in Ontario history, over $105 million, specifically focused on mitigating learning loss. We have increased mental health supports more than 200 per cent higher than with the peak of Liberal spending when uh, the former Premier was in power. We are fully committed to the safety of schools. I mean, the fact is, Mr. Speaker, today, as we deal with these variants of concerns and rising numbers in the community, you know, roughly 99 per cent of schools are open. 99 per cent of students have no active case. 75 per cent of schools don't have one case at all. And I recognize that this is a challenge. Ontario is not an island of, uh, you know, in and of itself. We are dealing with a global pandemic. But the strength we derive is from the resilience of our students, from the hard work of our educators, and from the sacrifice of parents, who every step of the way, I think, are doing their very best in an impossible circumstance to deliver Spons. quality education and safety to Ontario's youth. Thank you. The next question, the member for Tamiskaming Cochrane. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. The Premier suggested yesterday that he doesn't want to, and I quote, roll the dice when it comes to vaccinating people. Now, over the last year, the one thing the Premier is really good at is the folks he's saying to try to convey a message to people. We have all remember the Iron Ring, who can forget the 800-pound gorilla, and then there's the one about he, if he'd go get the vaccines himself and his F-150 cross the border himself. But we're facing a crisis right now that's going to take more than a folks he's saying. The stakes literally couldn't be higher. Regardless of the amount of vaccine, the province had months to come up with a plan on uh, that people should be able to understand and know when they can access it. Why does the government at this point still seem to be scrambling? It's going to take more than a folksy saying. Thank you. Through, through you, Mr. Speaker, I just uh, want to remind my colleague across the aisle there that we have vaccinated over 2.2 million people. And there's one thing that we're falling short on that I've never heard the opposition ever say at all, Mr. Speaker, is we're constantly short of the vaccines. We're, we're, we're putting these mass vaccination centers up. 
uh, a ton of effort, a ton of resources, a ton of people going there, and all of a sudden, bang, now we have to close it down again up at Wonderland. But you hear the same story over and over and over again. When can we count on a consistent volume of vaccines from the federal government? That's what it comes down to. We have built an infrastructure the likes of which this province has never seen. We're ready. We're ready to do nine million a month if we have as many vaccines as possible. But you know, Mr. Speaker, response. We 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 need the vaccines. We'll get it done. I just want to know what has the opposition done from day one? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Order. Regardless of how much vaccine we have, there is not enough vaccine. And we know the targets that the people who need it most. And what breaks my heart most is when I get seniors calling my office and we have to try and help them direct through the, the call center, through the website, through the... We had months. They had months to figure out that Seniors aren't all email literate. I'm not email literate sometimes. So, but why? Why? One thing the government's done not a good job at, they talk about overall number of vaccines that they've delivered, but there are vulnerable people who should have that vaccine, who because of the way the system is put up, can't access it. Question. Why? Why hasn't that, hasn't that been addressed? Thank you. Well, I, I find that ironic, Mr. Speaker. 2.2 million people uh, have found a way, and you don't have to go online. We have a 188 number that they can they can call, and may, maybe uh, the, uh, the my member from uh, across the, the aisle here might give the 188 number. Maybe they might be able to help out. But I'm so proud of the the rollout. And when you see other provinces around the world, systems crashed. Our system never crashed. We had a bump in the road. They had it fixed in an hour. Order. And, and it was amazing when we were being flooded by calls. Order. Now you can call within a minute, two minutes at the latest, you get an answer. They book your vaccine. We have hundreds of thousands. As a matter of fact, Shoppers Drug Mart alone has over 190,000 appointments booked that they can't fulfill because the federal government has not given us the vaccine and have not given us the date of when we're going to get these vaccines. It's as simple as that, my friend. The next question, the member for Mississauga Streetsville. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health. Many constituents in my riding are anxious to get the COVID-19 vaccine, and they're eager to help the province battle this virus in whatever way is possible. And I know the minister feels the same way because yesterday she received her first shot of the AstraZeneca vaccine and encouraged all Ontarians who qualify to roll up their sleeves and get the shot too. But, Speaker. Our province has had to face many uncertainties when it comes to the vaccines like ever-changing supply chain and pushback timelines from the federal government. Would the minister please provide this House an update on the rollout of these critical supplies in the face of so much uncertainty? Thank you. Minister Health. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Mississauga Streetsville for the question and for your advocacy on this issue. Much appreciated. Since day one, our government has been committed to vaccinating Ontarians as quickly and as safely as possible. By working with our partners across the province, we have put in place an integrated and robust network of locations capable of administering over 150,000 doses per day at over 250 vaccine sites, which are being led by local public health units and include hospitals, mass immunization clinics, mobile clinics, pharmacies, and primary care offices. Through the implementation of this network of locations and in collaboration with our partners across the province, we have been able to administer over 2 million doses of the vaccine. But we aren't going to stop there, Speaker. Our goal is to make sure that everyone in Ontario who wants a vaccine will get one as soon as possible. Thank you. Supplementary question. Thank you, Minister, and thank you to all of those front lines that help us administer these crucial vaccines. Speaker, I have to say our government's vaccine rollout has been quite an incredible thing to watch. In the face of so many obstacles, Order. our government has been dedicated to ensuring we roll Order. out those vaccines as quickly as possible to those who need them the most. 
We all know that as more supply becomes available, we can give more doses to more Ontarians. Would the minister please provide this House with an update on how the government plans to continue to ensure every person who wants a vaccine can get one? Thank you. Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. As we said many times before, nothing will stop us from delivering the most effective and equitable vaccine campaign in the country. And, Speaker, we are well on our way to achieving that goal by continually setting daily records for doses administered in one day and continuing to ensure that our most vulnerable are protected by having over 90 per cent of citizens. Member for York Centre is warned. Minister of Health, reply. We have over 90 per cent of long-term care residents fully immunized against COVID-19. Building from these successes, we've also put in place our provincial booking system and call centre, allowing Ontarians a convenient way to schedule their vaccine appointment or be redirected to their local public health unit who can help them get a vaccine appointment in their area. But let me be clear, Speaker, our government is ready to administer more COVID-19 vaccines and expand eligibility to Oops. many more Ontarians as soon as we as soon as we receive sufficient supplies of vaccine from the federal government. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for St. Catharines. Thank you, Speaker. Yesterday, Mr. Premier, as you were taking a victory lap inside one of Niagara vaccination cent clinics, my office was busy answering dozens of questions from seniors over 70, wondering why they were not able to receive an appointment and why the provincial vaccine program had a glitch. Yet once again, Niagara Public Health added 8,500 appointments on Friday, guessing that St. Catharines and Niagara might be in line for vaccination expansion for 70-plus age group. Here's the problem. Niagara had to guess which led to not having enough appointments available. This is because the official notice was only given the day before the expansion, on the 11th hour. Premier, you were on a photo op inside one of our vaccination centres. While outside the centre, there was still work to be done. Will you commit to a smoother vaccination rollout so seniors in Niagara and St. Catharines over the age of 70 do not have to struggle to get an appointment at a vaccination centre? To respond, the Premier. Well, through, through you, Mr. Speaker, when, it, when I when I, Mr. Order. Through, through you, Mr. Speaker, um, when I went down there, they were very grateful. Actually, one of the quotes uh, a, a few of the nurses told me is, thank God you came down here, you boosted everyone's spirits, you didn't stick there in the hideout at Queen's Park like the opposition uh, does. And so we went down there, we saw firsthand what an incredible job. Opposition, come to order. An incredible job, the mass vaccination uh, center is doing down there. And when I had an opportunity, I went by and, and talked to quite a few folks, and they said this was seamless. Never, uh, never thought in a million years how quickly we'd be able to get in there, get the vaccinations. And now we can ramp it up to the, the uh, my member across the aisle there, uh, Mr. Speaker. Again, uh, I, I don't know. Read, read my lips, as they say. We need the federal government to get more vaccines. Plain and simple, we don't have enough vaccines. Do you understand that? Simple. The official opposition must come to order. Start calling you out by name. Member for Ottawa South, come to order. The supplementary question, member for Niagara Falls. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and back to the Premier. And Premier, I'll be very clear with you. I do not hide out at Queen's Park. I'm in my riding all the time, and I, the constituents in my riding know it. Yesterday, the Premier was in Niagara and said anyone over 70 could simply call and get a vaccination appointment. If he actually spoke to the residents like I have, he would have known that they were struggling for days to get appointments. In Fort Erie, seniors who had their vaccination booked for weeks in advance had their appointments cancelled at 9 o'clock the night before because they overbooked issue caused by the government booking system. The Conservative government was told about these issues 11 days ago, yet they did nothing to fix it. Pharmacies are still waiting for doses so they can bin, begin saving lives in Niagara. The people of Niagara have already dealt with Moderna vaccines being diverted. Despite written evidence this government was given, the Premier is claiming that was a myth. 
which is a new word for me. Question. When will the Premier stop pretending the vaccine rollout is going smoothly in Niagara and take actions to protect our residents and save lives in Niagara? Thank you. Mr. Health Report. Thank you very much, Speaker. Well, there's several issues that need to be addressed here. One is the issue in uh, Fort Erie. That was an issue yesterday. That has been resolved, and people are now able to book their appointments. Secondly, there is the continuing myth that uh, Niagara was shortchanged in terms of vaccine. That is not the case. While they did not receive one type of vaccine, the Moderna, they did receive the Pfizer. So they did receive the proper allocation of vaccines. But third, it really is important for everyone to realize that we want to be able to ramp up. We want to be able to do 150,000 doses per day. We have the system in place to do that, but we do not have the vaccines. We are receiving 1.5 million doses of AstraZeneca from the federal government. It's coming to the federal government today, but we still don't know when it's going to be coming to Ontario. That's about 583,000 doses. Spons? We still don't know when that's coming. With respect to a large Moderna shipment, we expected that last week. We only received 30 per cent of it. The remaining 70 per cent of it has been extended to April 7th. So there's constant. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Scarborough Guildwood. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health. Scarborough is the hardest hit community in Ontario when it comes to the COVID-19 pandemic. The positivity rates are still in the double digits in Scarborough. In fact, if you talk to the people, they say we've just had one big wave all year long. The vaccine distribution is supposed to be prioritized by age, and the provincial science table says neighbourhoods as well need to be prioritized. Yet, when other areas in the province started vaccinating 80 over 80 residents. Scarborough lagged behind waiting to get their supply of vaccine. When Scarborough finally got enough vaccines to start their mobile clinics and to reach the most vulnerable in our community, now Scarborough is being told to wait again. Next week, 77% of Toronto's vaccine share will go to the mass clinics, and that will leave hospitals short resulting in a scale-back of their vaccination program like the mobile clinics that they are just starting to ramp up. So, Speaker, to the Minister, will you ensure that the Scarborough Health Network will not have to scale back their vaccination program next week to, and ensure they have enough supply to meet the Thank you. Minister of Health. Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. As I indicated earlier, a lot of the problem right now is because we don't have the vaccine supplies coming in and the quantities that we need in order to fill the mass vaccination centres, the mobile units, the pharmacies, which we want to expand in all 34 public health regions and in, in uh, primary care offices. We are waiting for a large supply of Moderna. We are waiting for 583,000 doses of AstraZeneca. So the problems in Scarborough are, are in large part no different than the problems that we're experiencing across the province. We need those big supplies coming in from the federal government. However, we are targeting uh, the vaccination campaign based on age and based on risk. There are a number of communities that have been identified as being at higher risk. Scarborough is certainly one of them. And what have we done? We have launched and implemented our high priority community strategy providing $12.5 million Response. to help local agencies deal with this. So we are paying attention to Scarborough and other areas at risk, as well as to our older community. Supplementary question. Speaker, um, Minister, I have seen the allocations for this week and for next week. And next week's allocation gives 77% to one location, UHN, and not to the other hospitals. So it creates an imbalance in terms of the continuous vaccination, and it confuses the public when they try to get appointments and they cannot. So it needs to be addressed. My question um, in follow-up to you is about the hospital. And I've spoken to you many times about the state of the hospital and the fact that it has been in the queue for many, many years now and needs to be advanced. We know that the ICU pressure on Scarborough is enormous. They are redirecting to Peterborough and to Kingston because of the number of COVID patients. They have well over 10% of the entire Question. load in the province in this one hospital that needs to be renewed. So why is it that in this budget there was no mention of funding 
and advancement of, the, of a new hospital for the people of Scarborough, given the need and the state of the hospital. Mr. Health. Thank you. Well, as I'm sure the member will realize, there is a long um, plan that has to be established for a hospital redevelopment. There has been some money that has been established to redo the emergency department at one of the Scarborough hospitals. That is something that is absolutely urgent, but it's something that we are paying attention to. We know that there are concerns there. We know that the population is growing. We know that the infrastructure in some places is outdated, and we are. it is on the list of projects to be completed. It is something that we know Scarborough is dealing with in terms of um, number of COVID patients in the hospital right now. That is why we have developed 3,100 new beds since the beginning of the pandemic, and the government recently allocated another $125 million to create 500 more spaces. In some cases, people do need to be moved from one location to another, but we have built up the capacity Response. so that anyone who needs to be in a hospital to receive COVID treatment or other treatment will be able to receive treatment in their area. Next question, the member for Mississauga Streetsville. Thank you, Speaker. In this phase of the pandemic, although it's critical to continue adhering to public health measures and remaining vigilant, we are encouraged by cautious optimism with the introduction of vaccines for adults that will help reduce the impact of the virus. With over 2 million vaccines administered, there is hope on the horizon. However, with that in mind, we know that the vaccination of the children and youth will be a critical part in keeping children and staff safe, keeping schools open and ending the pandemic. Can the Minister of Education please provide us an update on his work with the Minister of Health and the Solicitor General in proactively planning for vaccinating Ontario's children and youth? Thank you. Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member from Mississauga Streetsville for this question. Uh, I think it is quite obvious to all members of the legislature that we must learn lessons, uh, we must plan ahead, and ultimately help to defeat this pandemic by ensuring that our vaccine rollout can be much more uh, robust and efficient in its delivery. And today, as the Premier mentioned, we have a vaccine clinic in my, in my community of Vaughan that opened at Canada's Wonderland yesterday only for them to be closed today because of a lack of supply. The request of the federal government is to start today, while clinical trials are underway for children under the age of 16, to plan ahead, to procure now, and to make sure that there is a credible plan in place to immunize all those children that will want a vaccine critical uh, in our response to the pandemic and to our recovery as we look forward. Mr. Speaker, we cannot repeat the mistakes. And when I asked the federal government yesterday to uh, start the process of procurement and, of course, for Health Canada through in their independent Lots. review to rigorously review these, uh, uh, review these clinical trials on an expeditious basis, this will be critical to our recovery so that finally we can defeat this pandemic. Supplementary question. Speaker, being able to vaccinate children and youth will be a game changer in our fight against COVID-19. At this point, we're not out of the woods yet. COVID-19 is unfortunately still a major part of our lives and public health measures remain in place. Though we are still in the second half of 2021 school year, I'm already hearing questions from my constituents in my riding about what schools will look like next school year. Can the Minister of Education please share with the Legislature what plans and efforts are being made for the 2021-22 school year? Thank you. The Minister of Education. Thank you, Speaker. It starts with the recognition that this year has been very difficult on young people, uh, particularly through the lens of learning loss and mental health. And yes, uh, the government did ex invest additional dollars, uh, $700 million year over year, uh, in the budget committed to uh, quality, safe public education in September, but we will go further. This summer, the largest summer learning program ever unveiled in the province's history, $105 million allocation, specifically focused on credit recovery, on reach ahead courses, on helping young people get the support, mentorship, and access to a teacher I believe they deserve. We also, Speaker, are going to be unveiling the grant for student needs. And I can assure the member and all members of this legislature that that uh, funding vehicle will increase, specifically in areas of mental health, of special education, of supports dealing with reading. Uh, as well as mathematics, both of which have seen challenges at home and abroad. We are committed to making sure that the PP and Spons. all the protocols are in place, following the best advice of the Chief Medical Officer felt to ensure schools are safe and that children continue to learn at a high standard in this province. The next question, the member for Waterloo. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Experts advising the government on COVID-19 reveals a province at a tipping point. We have over 2,300 cases today in Ontario. And while vaccines won't get us totally out of this mishandled mess, they are one tool. Uh, which is why it's so crucial to get needles in arms. But in Waterloo Region, we aren't receiving our fair share. Our medical officer of health said Friday, right now, it isn't equitable. Waterloo Region should have received 89,000 doses, but instead they've only received 66,000 to date. Premier, why are the people of Waterloo Region not receiving their fair share? The Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. Well, the answer is lack of supply. That's the situation for our regions across the province of Ontario. We want to be able to expand into pharmacies. There are about 325 pharmacies offering the uh, AstraZeneca shot now. We want to expand it to 700 so that we can have at least three pharmacies in each region providing the, uh, the vaccines. But until we receive the AstraZeneca doses that are coming to us from the United States, we aren't able to do that because we do not have the supply. Supply. We don't even know when we're getting the supply. That's why we're asking the federal government to please provide us with this information so that we can ramp up, so that we can do those 150,000 doses per day and make sure that everyone in Ontario who wants to receive a vaccine will be able to get one. Member for Waterloo, supplementary. Speaker, this isn't uh, an issue of supply from the federal government. This is about the province distributing vaccines equally to all communities. This is about the provincial government following their own rules on distributing vaccines. Last night, I hosted a telephone town hall with local officials and a public health doctor to answer people's questions about vaccines. People have thoughtful questions about the efficacy and the vaccine rollout. Many callers, quite honestly, just want to hug their grandkids. Others were frustrated with how the province is handling resources and the vaccine rollout, calling it flip-flopping directives. Our regional government has asked that they be considered Order. a high-priority community to deal with increasing demands of COVID-19 pandemic on our marginalized communities, and they have a compelling case just to get their fair share of vaccines. Speaker, the government needs to get this right and ensure that resources on the vaccine rollout are Question. actually equitable to the Premier. Can you guarantee today that Waterloo Region will begin to receive its fair share of its vaccines? No more, no less, just what you promised them. Mr. Health. Thank you. Well, vaccines are being distributed equitably across the province based on population and based on risk. We know that there are some neighbourhoods that are particularly at risk. They will be receiving larger amounts, but again, it all goes back to supply. If we don't have the supply, we can't give it to any of the 34 public health unit regions across the province. We are doing the, the, what we can based on constantly changing supply uh, issues with the Moderna vaccine, with the AstraZeneca vaccine. There's virtually a daily recalibration Order. that has to happen across Ontario when we receive these news with respect to changes in supply, delays and so on. But we are still doing the work that we need to do in order to make sure that every public health region across the province, all 34 of them, receive their equitable allocation of vaccines based on age and based on risk. The next question, the member for Ottawa Vanier. Thank you, is for the Minister of Health. Last week, the Mayor of Ottawa wrote to the Minister to request a more equitable vaccine rollout in Ottawa. Given the geographic size of Ottawa, it's impossible to create equal access to the vaccine to all Ottawa residents. Pharmacies and primary care settings need to assist with the distribution of the vaccine. Our city has done a tremendous job at of getting as many of our neighbours vaccinated as quickly as possible, but for many residents, and certainly in my riding of Ottawa Vanier, mass vaccination sites are not easily accessible, being too far away, and we have none in our community. So my question is, will the minister expand pharmacy and primary care settings vaccination to the Ottawa region? And the Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. And my answer to the, to the member is yes, when we receive the supply. We want to be able to expand to more pharmacies, three at least in each public health unit, but we need to get the AstraZeneca supply in order to be able to do that. We did receive 194,500 first doses that expire as of April 2nd, and we have virtually used all of them now, and I'm sure we will 
prior to their expiry. But we need to receive the uh, additional 583,000 doses from through the federal government. We need to know when they're coming so that we can get them to the pharmacies so that they will be able to supply those vaccines to the people in the Ottawa area as well as to the rest of the province. So we are totally dependent on the federal government supplying us with those vaccines so we can expand. We are ready to go. We just need the vaccines. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is in French. I'm going to ask a question in French now. Many Francophones in my riding want to know why they can't get vaccinated at home. Yesterday, the mayor of Ottawa said that this city that has 7% of Ontario's population only gets about 5% of the doses. So that's another thing that's not working with the vaccine rollout. I'm happy to know that pharmacies will be included soon and will allow all residents to access the vaccine more easily. But I'd like to know why are we not communicating directly with the pharmacies? Why have we not communicated with the public health unit of Ottawa? The minister depends on these units to distribute the vaccine. Can she guarantee that Ottawa will get its fair share of vaccines? Well, uh, yes, Ottawa will receive its fair share of vaccines when we receive them. And the public health officer, Dr. Etches, is very well aware of what the situation is concerning supply, as do all of the local medical officers of health across all 34 public health unit regions, as do the Order. pharmacies. The pharmacies are aware that it's a supply issue. They are anxious to be able to provide more vaccines. We are anxious for people to, to receive them. But until we get them, we can't expand. We need the supply, and then we'll be able to expand immediately. Immediately. We're ready to go. We just need the vaccines. And uh, please, all of you, we'd ask you to please exhort the federal government to please send us the vaccines as soon as they oh, receive them so we can get going. Order. The next question, the member for Mississauga Streetsville. Thank you, Speaker. My question this morning is for the Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Minister. Ontarians across the province are feeling the impacts of COVID-19 on their mental health. I have heard from constituents in my riding that increased social and physical isolation, financial uncertainty, and having daily routines constantly changing have caused them to experience increased stress, anxiety, and depression. Through this year's budget, I know that our government is doing whatever it takes to protect the health of every Ontarian, and that includes our mental health. Minister, could you please update the members of this legislature on what our government will be doing to address the mental health and addictions of Ontarians this year? Thank you. Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member from Mississauga Streetsville for that excellent question. Mr. Speaker, through this budget, our government is placing a priority on the health of all Ontarians while building on the foundation to create the growth we need for a strong economy. Mr. Speaker, I'm proud to say that this includes making record-breaking investments in mental health and addictions every, in every corner of this province. Through this budget, Mr. Speaker, we're proud to be investing an additional $175 million this year alone, bringing our total spending on mental health and addictions care to an incredible $525 million this year alone. We're well on our way, Mr. Speaker, to achieving our goal of building a modern, connected, and fully integrated mental health and addiction system. This means more supports for all Ontarians of all ages, no matter where they are in the province of Ontario. Thank you. The supplementary. Speaker, I thank the minister for his response. I am proud to know that our government is delivering on its commitment to create a mental health and addiction system that fully supports Ontarians of all ages across the province. This budget truly demonstrates how serious we are when it comes to supporting the mental health of every individual and family in this great province. Speaker, some of my constituents have faced barriers to accessing mental health and addictions care, and we know the COVID-19 pandemic has only placed more stress on our mental health and addiction system. Minister, could you please explain the steps we will be taking to ensure that we are able to support the mental health of all Ontarians? Thank you. Associate Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, once again, I want to thank the member for that important question. 
As I've said many times here in the Legislature, every Ontarian deserves access to the highest quality mental health and addictions care that meets their unique needs. That's why through this budget, Mr. P Mr. Speaker, we're also investing in new and innovative services, a key pillar of our roadmap to wellness. This includes funding for four new mobile health, mental health clinics to serve rural and underserved communities. Also, through the Solicitor General, funding will see the creation of a new program to embed mental health care workers in police call centres to ensure people in crisis get the right supports. Mr. Speaker, this year's funding takes us one more important step towards building a mental health and addiction system that works for all Ontarians, no matter where they are. And that means, Mr. Speaker, since getting into government, $1 billion has thus far been invested in the mental health and addiction sector. Thank you. The next question, the member for Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. The vaccine rollout is not working for homebound seniors. One of my constituents registered her mother for a home vaccine almost a month ago, but she's still waiting. Her mother has dementia, and she worries about the risk posed by PSWs who come in to provide support. She also worries about the dental surgery that her mother needs, but that she continues to put off until her mother is safely vaccinated. These delays are unacceptable. Municipalities need help to deliver these programs. The Premier had months to prepare a vaccine rollout that works for everyone. Why are homebound seniors being left behind? And the Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. Nobody in Ontario is being left behind with our vaccine rollout. This has been carefully planned for months based on age and on risk in different neighbourhoods across all 34 public health unit regions. We know that there are some people that have uh, comorbidities. They may be homebound or they may have particular health situations that require them to either receive the vaccine from their primary care provider, and they are being supplied with a number of vaccines, or through their home and community care nurse who comes by to their home. This is a plan that we've developed to make sure that no one is left behind, that everyone who wants to receive the vaccine will get one. So in the case of your particular constituent, I'd be happy to assist if she's having difficulties in receiving the vaccine at home, because that has been planned for and calculated and arranged. And the supplementary question. Speaker, if it was working as the minister claims, then my constituent would have already been vaccinated. Seniors in my riding face an uphill battle to get a vaccine. For seniors above 70, vaccines are only being offered at one local health clinic, and many seniors cannot take the TTC to a mass vaccination clinic. Language barriers and a lack of internet access also make it difficult to learn about the vaccine rollout and book an appointment. As the variants spread faster every day, we urgently need mobile vaccine clinics that can meet seniors where they are. Again, Will the minister commit to the West End of Toronto getting reliable mobile vaccine clinics? Mr. Health. Thank you. Well, all of the issues that the member has just mentioned have been thought about and provided for. First of all, with our online booking tool, we recognize that many seniors are not comfortable with that, so they can call the online appointments uh, customer care centre and arrange their appointment that way. We also have uh, the messages and information available in about 50 different languages that people can access, recognizing, again, that some people have language difficulties. We are arranging for a variety of ways for people to receive the vaccine. If the mass vaccination clinics are, are not available for them uh, or close to where they live, we will be supplying them in pharmacies when we receive larger quantities of the AstraZeneca vaccine in uh, pharmacies, in um, primary care centres, as well as in mobile clinics, because we do know that there are certain neighbourhoods that we need to go into to provide the vaccines to people, and we are doing just that to make sure that all vulnerable people and in all communities across the province will be able to receive the vaccine. Thank you. The next question, the member for Guelph. Good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Since the Supreme Court smacked down the Premier's lawsuit to sabotage climate solutions, your minister has tried to defend the indefensible by talking about spending money to restore wetlands. Meanwhile, your government is pushing bills and projects to pave over wetlands and farmland. The government could save taxpayers money and reduce flood risk 
by not paving over wetlands and farmland in the first place. If the government's denial that they deny climate, the climate crisis has any credibility, Speaker, they would withdraw Schedule 3 from Bill 257 today. So, Speaker, will the Premier commit to saving money and reducing flood risk by not paving over wetlands and farmland and removing Schedule 3 today. To respond, the Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Well, thanks very much uh, from the member, uh, from the question from the member opposite, and uh, you know, giving me the opportunity to discuss our Made in Ontario uh, Environment Plan uh, and how we're moving forward, not only to protect land, air, and water, but also uh, focusing in on reducing greenhouse gas emissions to uh, hit our targets of 30% uh, uh, below 2005 levels. Uh, and uh, you know, we've come out with a, a number of, of programs uh, to head towards that target, Mr. Speaker. We have our our, our hydrogen strategy announcement that. So we've created this panel and consulting right now that we are going to be moving forward with the Ontario first ever hydrogen strategy, which is going to really uh, increase our opportunity to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions while also stimulating the economy, Mr. Speaker, because we all know in this House that the best way to fight climate change is to have a good balance between strong environmental protections and a strong, healthy economy, Mr. Speaker. And we're proud of $30 million that we're investing in wetlands across this province, not only to restore and to build wetlands, but we're going to ensure that they're there for the future generations down the road, Mr. Speaker. And a supplementary question. Speaker, I advise the minister to not pave over the wetlands in the first place. And, and, and if the hydrogen strategy has any hope of reducing climate pollution, then the government cannot double Government down. House Leader, come to order. Thank you, Speaker then the government cannot double down on fossil fuel expansion. Government House leaders warned. I apologize to the member for Guelph. No worries, Speaker. The government can't double down on fossil fuel expansion. The government is currently planning to increase climate pollution by 300 per cent over the next decade by ramping up power from gas plants. This will reduce the gains we made by phasing out coal by 40%, Question. Speaker. So, Speaker, if the Premier has any credibility in his belief that climate change is real, will the government commit to phasing out coal-fired power plants today? The minister to reply. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. For the member opposite, uh, uh, he's asking us to phase out coal-fired uh, plants. Uh, I think uh, we're well on the way at, at achieving that. Uh, started with the previous uh, progressive conservative government to start the phase to shut down those coal-fired plants. The government that uh, followed uh, finalized that plan and uh, actually passed legislation to ban use for of Durham, come to order. coal for energy in this power uh, for for the energy sector. Mr. Speaker, but I will tell the member opposite that we are going to move forward with phasing out coal in the industrial sector of this province, Mr. Speaker, something that wasn't completed. It will be completed under this government as we move forward to end the burning of coal entirely throughout this province in order to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. And I'm proud that uh, we'll be heading towards that. We'll be phasing out organics to the landfills, and we're going to implement our hydrogen strategy in order to combat climate change and get our reduction of emissions down to 30 percent below 2,000 levels. The member for York Southwestern. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. I have stood in this House many times speaking about how, many, how my community of York Southwestern has been neglected and left behind in this government's um, COVID 19 response. My writing is a pharmacy dessert. When it comes to vaccine access, we only have eight pharmacies in a very large writing. We do not have a permanent facility for vaccines for seniors. I am now hearing that those few pharmacies do not even have adequate supply for people. Why the inequities and why are residents, those essential workers and seniors, not getting equal access to vaccines from the government? Minister of Health. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Well, as the member will have heard today by my responses to many of the questions about why members feel that their area is not receiving an equal volume of vaccines, the answer remains the same. 
lack of supply. We are waiting to receive the AstraZeneca doses that will go into pharmacies, three in every public health unit region, but we need those vaccines. They're coming into Canada from the United States, going to the federal government, but we need to know when they will be coming to Ontario. Until that happens, we can't supply any more to pharmacies other than the remaining supply that they already have, which will be expired as of April 2nd, and we're going to make sure that not one dose is wasted, that they go into someone's arm. So we need the new supply. That's what we're waiting for. That's what we've asked the federal government for. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is back to the Premier. The lack of pharmacy locations and the complete lack of a permanent facility to distribute vaccines highlights the health disparities in York Southwestern, my community. That is not only bad public health policy, but it is discrimination along black, racial, and economic lines. Our high risk, hot sports, hard working community deserves the pandemic protection they deserve. Why is our hot sports community continue to be left behind? And what are your government's plans to finally address your COVID inequity response in this regard? The Minister of Health. Thank you. Well, as the member will know, there is one vaccination plan that is being rolled out across 34 public health unit regions. That is the plan that is happening based on age, based on risk. The local medical officers of health have been working with Dr. Williams, our chief medical officer of health. Dr. Devilla will have arranged to make sure that all parts of Toronto will have uh, places for vaccinations for all people. This is available through the mass vaccination sites, through the pharmacy sites, primary care, some specialty care sites, and mobile units. This is happening equally across the province. Right now, people are being asked for their socioeconomic data when they appear for a vaccine if they wish to provide it so that we can make plan for future health care decisions, and that is really important information. However, if people choose not Fonts. to provide that information, they will not be denied a vaccine. Anyone who wants a vaccine will be able to receive one. The next question, the member for York Center. Thank you, Speaker. To the Minister of Health, Ontarians are told we have to lock down because we have to preserve ICU capacity, that our hospitals will be overwhelmed, like New York or Italy. The only place in the world where hospitals were overwhelmed was the province of Lombardy in Italy. Even in New York, where COVID ravaged through nursing homes, there was no need for the USS Comfort Navy ship, which sailed a few weeks after arriving. So let's do basic math. With a total of 2,300 ICU beds, 1,400 non-COVID ICU patients, and 400 hospitalized patients with ICU with COVID, we have 500 ICU beds available. 22% of Ontario's ICU beds are empty. Sure, some GTA hospitals are closer to capacity, but that's nothing new. That's GTA hallway healthcare. You can easily manage this through transfers. So my question to the minister, am I correct that Ontario has more total empty ICU beds available than the total number of current COVID patients in all of our ICUs? And if so, are we still in lockdown or question. going into third lockdown in response to public health modeling? Minister of Health to respond. Well, thank you, Speaker. That was uh, quite a complicated question, but the answer to it is really simple. And I would say to the member through you, Mr. Speaker, that one of the reasons why our critical care beds and our ICU has not become overwhelmed is because we dealt with that. We planned for that from the beginning of this pandemic. We created over 3,100 new beds, which is the number of six community hospitals. We also built up the number of ICU beds. We're also ready to create field hospitals, mobile field hospitals. One is ready to go at Sunnybrook, and there's another one in Hamilton that can be created if we need it. We knew that there would be an increase in, in COVID hospitalizations, and we planned for that. And we've added over $5 billion of support for our public hospitals since the beginning of this pandemic. And so we're ready for whatever happens. But what we're doing is racing against time Response. with the vaccinations, and that is why we need the new supply to come in to make sure that we can get needles into arms as quickly as possible. But Thank, you. Thank you very much. The supplementary question. I'll take my question and answer is correct. 22% of Ontario's ICU beds are empty. Then why do you need the lockdown? We have more COVID ICU. We have less COVID ICU patients today 
than, COVID, than empty beds in ICU. Speaker, all the decisions made by this government are predicated on modeling. The lockdown, the suffering and the rationing of health care, all based on modeling from Steiny Brown and company. It started last April when they claimed that 100,000 Ontarians may die without intervention. Order. Remember that? Same folks. But the GTA has been in red and gray since October. That decision was made after Brown said that at the current case trajectory, Ontario will have about 250 ICU patients by end of October. Ontario met the case trajectory feared, but the number of ICU patients was 73, over three times less than Brown predicted. On January 12, Brown said that by the end of the first week of February, even with a rate of our rate of 1%, Ontario will have over 700 ICU patients. The R rate was Question. indeed 1%. So we met the case trajectory, but the number of patients in ICU was 325, or less than half than predicted. So my question is, why is the government making extraordinary decisions, locking down millions of Ontarians and ruining millions of lives on the basis of modelling that's proven wrong time and time again? And the response from the Minister of Health? The Speaker. What I can tell the member is that the modelling that has been done by Dr. Brown and his colleagues has been very helpful to us as we have planned for what might happen in the course of this pandemic. They did indicate that the variants of concern would become the dominant strain uh, by this time, and in fact, they have. But we plan for that with the uh, accommodations that we've made in our hospitals. But again, what I can tell the member through you, Mr. Speaker, is that several hospital administrators have advised us that they have a complete ICU absolutely filled with COVID patients right now. And that is why we are dealing with getting as many vaccinations done as possible and creating more spaces so that people can, if they need to be admitted because of COVID, they will be. But we are dealing with that. We are dealing with that in terms of creating more space, but also in the vaccinations. Over 2 Response. million vaccines have administered to date. We are getting them out as quickly as we can. As soon as we receive them for the federal government, we will get them out there. So we're dealing both with hospitals Thank you. That concludes our question period for this morning. Pursuant